so, so the question is really how to make your uh, research now. How can you make it accessible to people? How can you spread it? Because to me, my research is really cool. So I want people to know what I do and uh, to use it to feel their future research ideas. For sure. That's about it. So open access is the free, immediate online, avail online availability to peer-reviewed academic research with full reuse rights. Um, and it provides an alternative, alternative to the system where researchers do research, um, most often in publicly funded institutions, and then they hand over their work um, to publishers who then charge um, libraries large subscription fees or $40 to read one paper mm -hmm. for 24 hours. Yeah, right now, like 80% of research is publicly funded, but yeah. like a tiny portion of it's accessible, right? Exactly. So, uh, yeah. Um, most of it's in publicly funded universities or funded by people like the NIH um, in the USA or the Wellcome Trust in the UK mm -hmm. and lots of charities. But there's so much um, so much research, like you said, that's locked behind these, yeah. these pay walls that say pay $40. And while things are getting better, um, there's still a little, a little way to go. So if you go to openaccessbutton.org, um, you can sign up and download the Open Access Button, which is uh, an extension for Chrome and Firefox. And you can install a bookmarklet on any browser, and you can also get it for your Android phone. And whenever you hit that page that says pay $40, you use the Open Access Button. And we'll try and help you get access to research. Um, and we'll also, if you can't get access to the research, we'll add it to your wish list and continue to look for the, for the research. And if we, if it ever turns up in a research repository or somewhere on the web, we'll then send you a copy. And if you get access to research, you can make progress with your work. But if you don't get access to research, we add it to your wish list, and then we can use your story and the reason why you, you wanted to read this research in the first place to then make progress in the, this, the publishing system uh, to try and change it so yeah. this, type of, this type of problem never happens again. So the definition of open is super important, so you actually know, you know what we're talking about. Yeah. And open to me, and to a lot of people I think, is the ability um, to read, to reuse, um, to remix, and also to redistribute content, whatever it is, whether it's data, whether it's images, whether it's video. Um, the ability, all those kind of freedoms, and, and that's extremely important because if you restrict any one of those, then you don't have full openness, and, and that's a, a big problem for science mm -hmm. and for research. Um, so open is really, really important, and make sure you have all of those openness, not just that it's free to read, but you're not allowed to redistribute, that you are allowed to redistribute, you are allowed to remix, reuse, and, and have access, and that all of that is important. Yeah. Open access for me is uh, scholarship, uh, the results or the process of which mm -hmm. um, that is freely available to read and reuse by anybody of the world over without cost or barrier. Cool, because the cost or barrier thing is something I think all people originally think of, like, oh, it's free, so it's open. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there's a distinction there, right? It right. has to be able, to, you have to be able to reuse it. Yeah, right? you can't just read it. What if you want to reuse a figure or a table or some data yeah. or a quote? Then what do you do with it? You know, you can read it, but you can't use it. Then it's of limited utility. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So yeah, so what are, now that we know kind of what this is, mm -hmm. like why is it important? Why do we care? I mean, right. Yeah. So I'm a social scientist, I'm a linguist, and I'm a linguistic anthropologist, woo. so I've, I've got uh, one foot in social sciences, one foot in humanities. So we have a little bit of a different view from the medical fields and what open access can do mm -hmm. for us. Um, one of the things that's really important to me about open access is that we're taught to give back to the communities mm -hmm. that we study. So we go to these communities, these organizations, these groups of people, we interview them, we take their language, their data, their behaviors, their surveys, their words. I write a paper about it, I get a PhD, what do they get? Their taxes go to the university that supports my stipend or maybe the grant that I got if yeah. I, I'm lucky enough to get a grant. But um, you know, what does it say about the power structure where I take their, their words and their lives and write about it, get a PhD, and they get nothing? Yeah. And they can't even, you know, if I publish a paper, they can't read what I've written about them mm -hmm. without paying money. It's yeah. a terrible power imbalance. And I think one of the ways that social scientists and humanities can give back to the community, a very simple way, is just making their stuff available for the people for that sure. they're writing about to read. And that's a very important aspect of open access to totally. me. There are, there are three, four basic issues about open access. Mm -hmm. one, one of the mo most important issues, as a researchers, uh, the researchers in developed countries are, are sitting and they think that everything is available to everyone, but this is not the case. There are a lot of people who want to have access to, to the research which we do, and they want to know what's 
what is new out there or there are a lot of high school students a lot of teachers who want to have an access and and they always hit the paywall so that's very important yeah. to have open access very very important the second issue is i think the uh, which comes under the open access umbrella is open data yep. so a lot of people there are a lot of papers like there are more than 10000 papers coming out every month yep. and and we don't know how much of it is reproducible yeah. yeah so we definitely need to have the raw data which anybody can use and re redo the things and, and it can be reused as well this is also good for reusing the data and the third thing is so for a, i'm an early career researcher i'm, I'm a phd student at mm -hmm. the max planck mm -hmm. society and also a biomedical section representative at mm -hmm. the max planck and early career researchers have like if I want to get a job in future, I have to publish in really high impact factor journals. Mm -hmm. And these impact factors are created in 1960s so that librarians can judge to which journal they can subscribe or not. Yeah. And, and the whole system is basically now taking round and round around the impact factors because early career research at, se at several places are judged on the basis of impact factor, which yeah. make no sense. Yeah. How can I judge somebody who's publishing a paper in a lower impact factor and a high impact factor because the research is very different and the fields are very different. So this is another co concern, I think, uh, for especially for me, that we should get rid of impact factors, which is also under the, under the umbrella of open. To, doing a, uh, to select people on the basis of math, mm -hmm. doing mathematics, like, yeah. oh, this is the number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So above 14, everybody's in. Below yeah. 14, everybody's down. <laughs> yeah. I think this doesn't make sense. For sure, yeah. totally. Yeah. yeah, some fields. In some fields, you can really publish uh, in a ri really high impact factor papers, and and in some fields like uh, archaeology, yeah. where pe pe it's not it's not easy to publish really high impact factor. A lot of journals are coming with different different policies, and I think it will improve. And I I, I can see in the next 10 years everything will be open. Definitely. And uh, even the the really these high journals, Elsevier and Nature, they yeah. are also. Uh, getting towards open yeah. access things and, and getting more open and open. Well, they're too pressured. I mean, there's no, yeah. there's becoming no other option, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And but as early so, career researchers, I would say if, if you are uh, publishing in a high impact factor mm -hmm. journal, and if, if it's closed, I, I, I request, please put a pa paper on archive, or yeah. if it's not possible, do a preprint ed uh, edition on a repository. Yeah. Uh, or on archive or any other any place where you can submit yeah. your data or a paper. So I'll put some links below to some uh, repositories. Yeah, because yeah, that's that's, a, that's that's really it's something people don't know about. Yeah. I mean, if you don't publish in an open access journal, that doesn't mean you can't make your stuff available. Yeah. I make openly. my paper. I mean, I published uh, recently a paper, yeah. and I make my uh, I already my paper is already there in the repository. So yeah, exactly. So that's exactly. very important to put your paper on, in, on repository. So with research, you know, you put up the article, and there's some nice figures in it. There's lots of data points and you can see in the figure. Mm -hmm. But what happens if someone wants to reuse that data behind the figure? You know, you can't just take a JPEG and put that into a spreadsheet or put that into R or whatever yeah, statistical software you use. You measure with a ruler. A <laughs> and, and so the ridiculous thing is research, even in 2014, thousands of researchers across the world to actually build on the analyses of their colleagues are actually getting out their ruler or maybe an on-screen ruler on a PDF. And I've seen people do this, mm -hmm. zoom the PDF, you know, look at the scale bar and then measure where the point is to get the X coordinate and the Y coordinate and do that for every single point. Crazy. And the saddest thing is that that's what a lot of graduate students are being used for at the moment. A lot of mm. PhD students, master's students, even undergrads are being used as slaves of data extraction. And the problem is that people are, in a lot of journals aren't actually publishing the underlying data. Mm. Or if they are publishing the underlying data, it's in an inappropriate, inextractable format. Mm. So a very common thing that people will do is upload the data as a PDF. Yeah. Except what statistical program actually can accept a PDF as input? PDF yeah. is just digital paper, right? You can't actually reuse data from PDF. If you're lucky, you'll be able to copy and paste out the data, but then you've got, yeah. you know, the page numbers of the PDF getting in the way. I've had to remove page numbers from loads of data sets. You know, it's, there's a table like sp split across, across like four pages or something. Well, yeah, and even if you're using, even if you're posting your data somewhere, say, 
not as a PDF, but something that's readable, yeah. you need to post it in a format that is exactly. open, right? Yeah. So and, and that, you know vary. a lot about that. So. That will vary from, you know, what depending on what the data is. So mm -hmm. you've got to look at what the community standard is. Yeah. And, you know, there are, there are options you can look at, like choosing non-proprietary formats, which is really important. So I always recommend if it's a spread, spreadsheet data, for example, a lot of people use spreadsheet data, save it as a um, comma separated values file or a tab separated values so file. CSV. CSV or, or TSV. Yeah. Um, because that's much better actually than a spreadsheet file because a spreadsheet yeah. file like XLS um, is Microsoft owned it's a proprietary format and actually there's a, um, a whole more variety of different softwares that can open up CSV files yeah. than can open up and, and reuse um, XLS files yeah. so it's, it's really important that you choose an open format as possible and it's also as simple as format possible just yeah. to make it easier to reuse your data. In the social sciences and humanities there aren't a lot of open access mm -hmm. journals that are available. There are some, and there are some really good ones. Um, there's uh, cultural anthropology, Colands, which just went open access, which is awesome. I love them. Um, <laughs> but if you're, you know, if you're in a different field, there's not a whole lot of options. So um, we always advocate to go green. So you can publish with whoever you want, but make a version of that paper available in your institutional repository on Impact Story, on Figshare, and make sure you're doing it according to all the policies. But and then disseminate it, or you can write about it, you can blog about it, you can tweet about it, you can write a, a magazine article about. It. Put a story on Medium. I mean, what, get your work out there, get people reading it. There's a ton of ways to do it. You're just limited, bounded by your own creativity. Yeah. So I will give a plug here for my friends <laughs> in the library. Okay. So if you're at a, an institution, mm -hmm. you have librarians who are on your side, and they know a lot about the, so, the scholarly publishing landscape. And librarians rock, and just a side <laughs> note. <laughs> librarians totally rock. I work with them in an office of scholarly communication and publishing. They are awesome. They know everything. They can find a way for you even if they don't know how to do it. They'll figure something out that'll work for you. Mm -hmm. And if you're confused about copyright or what you're allowed to do or maybe where you can publish this stuff or what would the proper format be or how you can disseminate it, there's a librarian just waiting with those answers for you. So that is the number one, number one resource for oh. people of any field. Librarians. Librarians. Awesome. There's lots of help and advice out there. If you go to the Right to Research Coalition website, um, there's lots of helpful advice. There's a really great YouTube video um, called Open Access Explained, which explains open access in eight minutes. Okay. I'll um, add the link. Yeah, you'll add the link. <laughs> and if you go to openaccessbutton.org forward slash advocacy, okay. um, there's lots of frequently asked questions and guides that you can that you can use to talk about open access and bust any myths that people have about open access and figure out how you can make yourself open and how you can advocate for yeah. open access. Um, in doing things like talk to your friends or sign up to the Right to Research Coalition or get your organization to sign up. <laughs> so if your university doesn't have a repository, try and set one up or try and um, implement open policy yeah. in your university. And like I said before, there's lots and lots of help mm -hmm. for anyone who wants to advocate for open access or even just start educating about open access. Sure. Um, you can find us on the internet, yep. um, whether that's us at the open access button. Um, you can email us at, you can email me at david at openaccessbutton.org or you can contact the Right to Research Coalition for any help or support you need um, to advocate and educate about open access. Cool, sweet.